Hallelujah. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Alleluia. Here again, words written for us in 1 John chapter 3. This then is his command, that we believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and that we love one another just as he commanded us. The one who keeps his commands remains in God and God in him. This is how we know that he remains in us. We know it from the Spirit whom he has given to us. You may be seated. Dear branches connected to the true vine. It was over. Finally over. The news spread quickly. Parades flooded the streets around the nation and even around the world. Crowds gathered and cheered. Strangers hugged. Some even kissed. They sang. They prayed. They woke up the next day and eagerly read the papers. Yes, it was really true. They really won. It was real. It was over. Now what? We know what. The soldiers came home from Europe and the Pacific. They got married. They started families. They got to work. They got to life. The nation never forgot what it had lost. Many had sacrificed much. Families still mourned. Soldiers remembered the evils they had witnessed, the horrors of humanity at his worst. They never forgot the battle, but they remembered for what they fought. They fought for life, so life they lived. Now what? Jesus lives. The victory's won. Satan is crushed. Death is broken. Sin has been wiped away forever. Easter Sunday, we celebrate. We sing Alleluia. We gather together. We eat with great joy. Then we come again and we listen as Thomas testifies Yes, it's real. Jesus lives. Again, we come. And Jesus appears and he says, peace, real peace be with you. He gives forgiveness. He gives you forgiveness to give to others. Again we come and we hear the voice of the good shepherd calling us. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. And we know that he will never lose those he has called. So, now what? John knows what. He, we remember not only what Jesus saved us from, but also what Jesus saved us for. This is what. We live in the resurrection reality. We live in love by living in Christ. People often say what they're gonna do, what they're gonna achieve, who they are gonna be. They may even mean it when they say it. She has an idea of what she's going to do with her life after she finishes college. But after working all those years and doing all of that studying, the world after college doesn't look like the world she expected. The young man says, well, someday I'm going to grow up. Someday I'll mature. Someday I'll be a good man. But he finds that those habits of youth are hard to shake. We all say we want to be good people. I don't know of anyone who doesn't ever try to be kind, who in their right mind advocates for cruelty, who doesn't think that love is a good thing? Who doesn't want to be on the right side of history? But John warns, talk is easy. 
We are prone to confuse the idea of love, the desire to love, even saying what we think is the loving thing as love itself. John literally tells God's people, do not love with a word or with a tongue. Your tongue, your speech, is the least effective way to love. In fact, your tongue is the most efficient way to avoid love. Because you can say the right thing, and everyone will think well of you. But you don't have to do anything. You can be on the right side and you feel good even if you never lift a finger. When we see disasters happening far away, the scene affects us. We can't ignore such a thing, so what do we do? We send our thoughts and our prayers. But we don't just pray. No, no. We announce that we will pray. Maybe we announce that we are praying, but usually that we intend to pray. And I wonder how many have said those words, thoughts, and prayers, but they neglect to even do that. Do Christians not deserve the scorn of the unbelievers if that is our only response to every disaster? The uselessness of loving in word and tongue is universal. Saying, feed the hungry, does not put food on any plate. Saying, no justice, no peace, brings neither justice nor peace. A yard sign helps no one. Facebook posts don't make the world a better place. No demonstration. No matter how fervent the feeling there, no demonstration actually lifts anybody up out of suffering. And our culture says much, but we do so little. I can hear the excuses now. Well, what can I do? What can I do for those who are suffering in the Levant? What can I do for those who are in Ukraine? What can I do for the migrants? What can I do for those who have undergone disaster? There might be a few who can go, who can volunteer, who can get their hands dirty, but most cannot. There are some who give a little money, but we recognize that the needs outweigh all that we can possibly give. Jesus himself said, the poor you will always have with you. Is sending our thoughts and prayers not the best we can do? Well, who told you you had to do anything? This is a problem of modern technology, modern news. Are these things your responsibility at all? When tr the troubles of the word, world weigh on your heart, indeed pray. Place them in the Lord's hands. He will govern all things according to his wisdom. But does your announcement help anything? Instead of saying, I'm going to pray, do it. And no one but God needs to know. Jesus says, when you pray, go into your locked room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in heaven. John says, do not love with a word or a tongue. Sadly, when we care about things we cannot change, when we love those who are far, far away, this isn't real love. It is avoiding love. We need to consider more carefully our Lord's own example when he took on human flesh and lived in humility. Were there not problems in the ancient world? No disasters, no injustices. Yet in his day-to-day -day actions, did Jesus set out like so many idealistic people today to change the world and make it a better place? Was he going to perfect society? 
for 30 years. God's own incarnate son was just Joseph's son, the craftsman. I wonder how many homes in Nazareth had repairs that Jesus did with his own two hands, even after his ministry began. Yes, he was a healer, but always one-on-one -on -one with the people he met while he was on his way. He didn't solve the problem of disease. He didn't teach them about bacteria and illness. He was a provider. He gave bread to the crowds when they were in a remote place, but he didn't solve hunger. He didn't reform their farming practices. He was a teacher, but he didn't advocate for a new education system. You see, Jesus lived exactly like John would write for us. Let us love in action and in truth. We cannot imagine that the little things of life, being a husband, a wife, a friend, a worker, a member of your community, that these unspectacular everyday things don't matter. They mattered to Jesus. We can only understand what it means to love in action and truth by looking at him. Love done for yourself, for your image, for your self-esteem, for your righteousness, for your conscience, is not love at all. That is not service. It is self-service. Love. True love. Genuine love cares nothing for self. Love always serves the other. When you love in action and truth, you give of yourself, of your time, of your energy, of your physical blessings for the good, and we need to understand what that means, for the good of the other, for the good of the body, feed, clothe, shelter, care. God has placed people in your own life who need you. Love them. And if the people closest to you do not need so much of the portion of your love that you have more to give, well, by all means, extend that love further and further beyond yourself as much as you can. Love in action and truth also cares for more than the body. It cares for the soul. Love that excuses sin. Love that enables sin. Love that ignores sin. Love that lies about sin cannot be love. Love that is afraid to make someone angry with you. Love that will not talk about Jesus to those who do not want to know him cannot be love. That means love and action and truth will often cost you much, even more than your time and your possessions. John has said, do not be surprised if the world hates you. But Jesus encourages you, fear not. I have overcome the world. This is the resurrection reality, what it is to live in the resurrection reality. Jesus has died for your sins. He has baptized you into his name. He has clothed you in his righteousness. You are his children. You are heirs of God. That means you have nothing to earn. You have nothing to prove. You are completely set free to live in love. Let God handle a world that seems at war with the good, at war with God, and still enamored with sin. And give thanks that God has placed you here. God has placed you into the lives of many others. God has given you plenty of work to do. You have plenty of love to give. Live in such a love. When we live in love, when we go about doing the work that God has given us to do, 
We have immediate benefits for that. This is how we know we are of the truth and how we set ourselves at rest in his presence. When we devote our lives to the purposes God gives, we rest at peace at night. When our days are filled with the work God has given, our hearts are reassured. I can't save the world, but today I did the work God has given me. However, that feeling is elusive for me. I often find myself focusing far more on all I have failed to do, all I have left undone, and all the things that I have sadly done instead of doing the things God has given me. When I look to my love for reassurance, I don't find rest. I find condemnation. I'm not alone. John felt this way too. If our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our hearts. And he knows all. Luther captured this powerful truth beautifully. The conscience is one drop the reconciled God, a sea of comfort. If I look to my own love, well, I will always thirst for reassurance. But when I look to my God, I am filled to the brim. Our failures are nothing compared to God's success. Your defeats can never rob Jesus of his victory. Your sin can never erase Jesus' sacrifice of love. Your weakness will never hold back God's powerful forgiveness. Your conscience doesn't even know how God smiles upon you whenever you do the things he has placed into your hands. But God knows all. No one sees when you give that cup of water in Jesus' name. But Jesus sees. And in the end, we will say, Lord, when did we do these things for you? But when all of your sins have been forgiven, when they have been removed as far as the east is from the west, when in Christ your sin is the only thing God cannot remember, then all that will remain for the Lord to see is all the things you have done to please him. Therefore, do not let your heart condemn you. You live in Jesus. You live in his forgiveness. You live free to love in God's wonderful grace. This is what we need to live in the resurrection reality. Beloved, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence with, before God. God will never turn us away. He will never deny us. He will never look upon you with shame in his mind. We also receive from him whatever we ask because we keep his commands and do what is pleasing in, your, in his sight. You never need to hesitate to pour out your heart to the Lord. You do not need to hold back the desires of your heart. God leaves no doubt that he will always hear. He will listen intently. He will always answer for your good. Meanwhile, the devil lists all the reasons why you shouldn't pray, why you can't pray, why it will be no good for you to pray, but the devil lies. Nothing will keep God from hearing your prayers. Nothing can hinder him from working all things for your good. He will always give you what you need. He will always provide you with the power to be about his business. Therefore, pray in confidence so that you can live in that confidence. At what point do you find yourself stopping pull, putting things on your to-do list? I don't know about you, but my to-do list only seems to go in one direction. It gets longer and longer. 
Now, it's nice to know what work needs to be done, and it's good to find a way to prioritize it, and it does certainly feel good to be able to put that big check mark down when something's off the list, but we all know that the most important things of life don't even make the list. And it is an unfortunate thing when instead of serving you, you live to serve your list. When I look at my to-do list, I can't help but notice how different it is from the list the Lord gives. His list only has two items. This is my command, that we believe in his Son, Jesus Christ, and that we love one another just as he commands us. God's list is short. God's list is easy. On one hand, everything God desires of you is already done in Christ. On the other hand, you will never run out of opportunities to do things that please God, to serve each other in love. Jesus said, the one who remains in me and I in him, he is the one who will bear much fruit. And John restates the thought of the Lord. The one who keeps his commands remains in God and God in him. We remain in God by faith in Jesus. Faith in who he is, God's son, the Messiah. Faith in what he has done, lived for us, died for us, risen for us. Faith in what he has guaranteed, the forgiveness of sins and eternal life. And Jesus promises you, that faith will produce good fruit. Those who live in the God of love will love as God loves them. Those who live in God's forgiveness can live confidently, freely, and joyfully through every moment of their lives because your list is wide open for all that you can do to please the Lord. The victory is won. All the enemies are defeated. Of course, that is worth celebrating. Of course, that day is worth commemorating. Of course, we will sing. Of course, we will take a few weeks to revel in that joy and let that reality fully take hold of your heart. But we do not stop there. A victory of this magnitude must be lived. Our Lord won the victory so that you can live. Live in him. Live in love. Live in faith. Live in confidence. For this he came. For this he lived. For this he died. His resurrection secured this, your life, your full life. For this he has left no doubt, but he has given you every assurance, for he has filled you with his own power. He has given you his own Holy Spirit. So by that power that dwells in your hearts, you know what to do. Live in that resurrection reality today and forevermore. Amen. Please rise. And now the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We join now in confessing our faith with the words of the apostles.